Well, welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. This is Chris Honholtz joining you on this April 22nd, 2024. We are nearly a full four months through this uh, this year already, and so much of it has been done without my good uh, friend and partner in crime here, Richard Story. I'm uh, going to ask you, as always, to keep he and his family in your prayers. They just continue to find many things that the Lord is carrying them through right now with regard to family illnesses and, and other issues. And so uh, we are really hoping to have him back at least for the next program, which will six, seven days away, uh, will be eight years of Voice of Reason Radio being on the air, so to speak. <laughs> Not in a literal sense, because we don't do radio, but in a podcast form and, and now video format. Uh, so we are really missing him. We really wish he could be here with us. I know he would love to be here. And so we are grateful beyond measure that you guys are continuing to keep him in your prayers and that you continue to support this program, even when it's just me. <laughs> so we are so very thankful to have you with us this week. As always, want to remind you, we are part of the Christian Podcast Community that is a conglomeration of Christian podcasts that are sound in the faith, uh, good, sound biblical theology. Uh, we all are vetted before we come in. This is not somebody who stuck Christian label on something, claimed it to be a Christian, and therefore, please include us. But rather, we actually go through uh, an application process. There's an interview process. And even though Rich and I were well known to those who were uh, who had put this together, they still made sure that you know we met those standards. So that's that's what we always want to encourage you with is when you check out the uh, uh, programs on Christian Podcast Community, you know that you're going to have something that at least is biblically sound, and that gives you a good starting place. So please always check that out. Also want to remind you that you can uh, find our website at slavetothekeng.com. And uh, from there, you, you'll have find our social media connections, the ability to contact us, uh, ways to support the show if you so desire. Uh, we always ask if you're going to support, first and foremost, please, please just be praying for us because we want to honor the Lord and we want to uh, be a, a, an edifying force to the, the Christian church. And so we can only do that in so much as we are being faithful to the Lord and that we are looking to honor Him and, and do everything that He calls us to do um, so that everything is about reflecting Him and His goodness, His graciousness, His kindness. And so your prayers for us to do that, to be obedient to the Lord in that regard, would be very, very much appreciated. Also, uh, as we put more content out, whether it's videos, as what we're doing on, on YouTube, uh, more podcast programs, or as I begin to put out more articles, uh, which I am getting better at doing. I'm trying to be a bit more consistent. Um, that's where you're going to find it. It is kind of your one-stop shop. And so uh, we encourage you to go check that out, and we hope that it is a blessing to you. And we also recommend, you know, put yourself down as a follower of the webpage. Now, I had this question come up, so I'm going to do a quick lesson here. Bear with me as I wet my whistle. Um, if you are... Um, I'm digging up my phone here. I want to try to, I'm going to try to show this to people who are, uh, oops, that's the wrong one. If, if uh, who do this via mobile. Um, if you, if you're listening to this, you can't see what I'm doing. So I'm going to try and describe it. But if you were to pull up slave to the king.com on your mobile phone, it's obviously a narrow little, uh, mobile version of the page. And people are like, well, how do I subscribe? The easiest answer to that is to turn your phone sideways. And when you do, the uh, side columns with all the various uh, things, including subscribing to the website, become visible. That's just how it's set up. Um, understand that we don't have IT staff. Uh, it is literally Rich and I that run this, and uh, I'm more or less the guy that <laughs> has to try to figure out how to make the website work. And uh, we're very grateful to WordPress to make for making things easy, uh, but... There's just a, a, a finite amount of knowledge that I have. And so I use the theme that seemed to work the best, look the best for you know, yeah, for the website. So there are always little catches to how you figure that out. So if you are going via mobile instead of your computer browser or maybe an iPad or tablet of some kind, 
and you are looking at the mobile page, you're going to have to turn that screen sideways. Then the side columns come up and you can find the subscribe, uh, the little box to subscribe. So recommend you do that. That way you get notifications. Um, we actually had someone, the reason that question came up is I had done a couple of articles recently. Now I've said before, but if you're new to the program, I published to both uh, slavesofthekingcom but I'm also pushing articles out on X, which used to be called Twitter. I really wish Elon would come up with a better name. I'm trying to be respectful because that's the site name, but it's really easy to say Twitter because that's what everybody knows. But uh, I'm pushing articles on there as well. The thing is, is that we don't have like say Substack, which sends you an article straight to your email. There might be a way to do that with uh, with WordPress. I'll look into it. Uh, something I hadn't considered up to this point. But he wanted, you know, the, basically to have the articles come to him. The only thing I could suggest at the time was going to the website and subscribing because then at least he would get the email notification that there was a new article up. Because social media is fast and furious, and if you don't, uh, if you don't, if you're not there when the article comes out, you might miss it. And I do my best to try and put it out multiple times so that people are aware of it. But it's just one of those things. So email still has its uses, folks, believe it or not. So this is one way you will be notified that there is something new on the website that you can follow up on. So really recommend you do that. Uh, if you have questions, comments, concerns, even pushback, which we have no problem with pushback. Um, and by the way, if you give me pushback, just expect that I may or may not agree with it and I might push back myself. So it doesn't mean I'm angry with you. It doesn't mean I'm uh, unwilling to learn or unwilling to consider. It's just how de debate and discourse works is that we go back and forth. I haven't had too much problem with that, but social media has kind of trained us to think that if I snark at you, you you have to listen to me. But if you push back, then you you just don't want to receive correction. We We all do this. We all struggle with it. I do as well. But just wanted to put that out there. If you do give pushback, just be willing to interact with it if I if we decide to to go back and forth with you on it. Uh, but that's a great way to, to get in touch with us. It's a great way to let us know whether or not the this particular program is helpful to you, whether or not uh, there are topics that you would like to hear uh, or questions that you need to have asked. You know, those are types of things that we can't know if we're – uh, if the stuff we're putting out is helpful, if we don't hear from you. So we assume that as long as you guys are downloading and listening, that you're finding it useful and it's being a blessing to you in some way. And we have had some really nice um, uh, responses from recent programs, which I'm grateful for because it's hard to do this by myself without my, uh, without my buddy, Rich. Um, it's not, and I'm not complaining about that, but this is a program that we've built over eight years together and doing this solo, number one, feels so weird to me. And I think I've said this plenty of times before, but also it's um, we get that we get two different perspectives and voices um, where I might be a bit more analytical. Rich will bring in that pastoral or evangelistic um, way of thinking. And neither of us are scholars. Neither of us are um, trained theologians or pastors of any. We're just lay people in, uh, in our churches serving as best we can. Um, but having those perspectives can help really bring more to the table. And it's, I can't do what Rich does because that's the way God built him. And I really look forward to the day we can have him back on here. So pray for Rich, please. I'd like to have him back as I'm sure you would all as well. So that I think pretty much covers, excuse me here, um, pretty much covers all the, uh, the housekeeping things. So hopefully, uh, those are things that will help you and help you uh, to know what you can do to keep keep tabs on the program. Um, now, as far as today, so this is kind of sort of related to the, the late, latest kerfuffle in evangelicalism, but not quite. I am going to mention Mark Driscoll and I am going to mention, mention John Lindell, but maybe not in the way that you guys are thinking. Um, and the reason I say that is because I'm actually – been asked to come on Apologetics Live this Thursday. Now, today is Monday, as I said, the 22nd of April. By the way, thank you all for uh, being patient with me on, on letting pulling this out on Monday instead of last over the weekend. Um, at hit, I've hit my middle age years, and uh, as I do more things, try to accomplish more things in, in a day, my body goes, why? <laughs> so hitting the gym in the morning, going to the Costco in the midday, and then coming home and doing yard work at the end of the day, 
uh, I sat down and I did not want to get up again. So and my body was not very happy with me in that regard. So thank you for uh, for the, the um, allowing me to postpone for just a couple of days. Uh, but so in just a few days, I'm going to be on Apologetics Live, and we're actually probably going to get into the Mark Driscoll ker- ker- kerfuffle a bit more uh, specifically. But I think it sets kind of the the backdrop of what I wanted to talk about, which is going to be kind of encapsulating uh, some things that I've been learning in the book of Hebrews uh, as I spent my time this week going through that uh, particular book. My goal this year is not to so much read the entire Bible as which most people do, but it's literally going to be spending just uh, week after week after week pouring through the New Testament. So right now, made it to the book of Hebrews, and uh, as I read through it, there were just so many things that struck me about how the uh, the author of Hebrews communicates his message about Jesus is better, therefore, as a Christian, you know, no, as a person, don't reject this salvation, you know, come into the Sabbath rest, and, you know, here's the hall of faith that you should emulate, all based on this message of, of Jesus is better, meaning better than the prophets, better than the angels, be, better than the, the, the better sacrifice, the, the better high priest, all of these things. All of that informing, therefore, why we do what we do from our salvation to our sanctification to our uh, everything that uh, our Christian walk. And as I'm reading through this, I'm struck by this whole kerfuffle that has happened. And I've, I've stolen that term kerfuffle from Todd Friel of uh, Wretched Radio. I just think it works prop- entirely appropriate for this kind of situation. But I, I see how different that situation is from how the author of Hebrews communicates his message. And so let me give you, if, if, if you're not aware of it, you've, you've, well, look, you've been spared a lot of drama. Let me just put it that way. But let me give you kind of an encapsulation of what's happened. Uh, last week, if, you, if you're not aware, Mark Driscoll and John Lindell of James River Church, and all part of this Stronger Men's Conference, had a major dust up and it seems to still be going. Basically what happened is James River Church puts on every year this massive event called the Stronger Men's Conference. And uh, if you haven't if you don't really know much about James River Church or this conference, I would I'll put it in the show notes um Justin Peters, he's got actually two videos on this and I'm only just starting the second one where he uh, interviews uh, Phil Johnson about James River Church and Mark Mark Driscoll. But his first video with Gabe Hughes does a really good job of outlining what happened. So I'm going to give you uh, kind of the Cliff's Notes version, but I'm going to encourage you to go watch that hour uh, hour and a half video, I think it is, where uh, you know Justin and Gabe really go through that, and then Justin interviews uh, another gentleman and uh, who was on staff at Grace Community Church when Mark Driscoll did his book publicity stunt at the um, Strange Fire Conference. So giving you some background on. Uh, Mark Driscoll himself. So I really encourage you to go see it. So basically what happened is this Stronger Men's Conference is kind of this hoorah, he-man, um, you know, pat ourselves on the back about how cool we are as men kind of conference, labeled as a Christian conference. And I say labeled because it's not really all that Christian. James River Church, uh, I think Justin Peters well, well explained, it's basically a prosperity gospel church. Uh, Bill Johnson and others have, you know, shown up there and preached and stuff. So it tells you the quality of the quote preaching that goes on at James River Church, and it's a mega church, and it, you know this, you know, uh, brings in thousands of men every year. And so at these uh, at these conferences, they'll always have some sort of big uh, event of some kind. One year they had monster trucks. One year somebody had, I think it was last year, they brought a tank in. Now I tell you something, as somebody who is a former army tanker, that I look at the picture of that tank and all the flames and the cars being crushed and I go, ooh, ooh, ooh. why? Because I like tanks. That's what I was in. But I look at that and I go, but it has no place in a Christian event. It, this is nothing more than pandering to the masculine, you know, the the tip, stereotypical masculine image, big noisy machines crushing stuff, right? Uh, I think Justin Peters mentioned they had a boxing match or something in, at, at one of these. So there's always some sort of uh, manly entertainment event that is part of this conference. 
So this year, uh, what they did is they had a sword swallowing act. Now, I'm sure most people are familiar with the idea of a sword swallower. But if you're not, it's basically somebody who is able to kind of angle his head and his throat perfectly so he can insert the sword down through and then do whatever fairing, uh, daring feats of do that he's going to accomplish. And in this particular instance, it was climbing a, a, a pole, uh, much like you would see... Um, if you've ever watched things like America's Got Talent, the the talent shows where they do, you know, they swing on ropes or climb on poles or you know use the 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 ribbon type type stuff, say Cirque du Soleil, you know that kind of thing. It's that kind of athletic prowess that he was demonstrating. Now, to to that end, again, if you've ever watched something like America's Got Talent, the guys almost always will shed their uh, their shirt to show their rippling muscles, and that's what this individual did. He, uh, you know, he had a kind of a, a show jacket, sleeveless jacket type shirt, rips it off, climbs the pole, you know, was able to kind of with it, just with his legs and his body extended, showing you how, how much control he has over his body. Then he does the sword swallowing act, climbs the pole, kind of flips himself upside down, and then slides down the pole while the sword's still in his throat. And he's basically plunging headfirst with his arms uh, splayed out, stopping just inches before the ground where the if he, if he had gone any had gone any lower that thing would have shoved up into his throat and caused serious damage of course a death defying act so why is that important well here's what the drama uh, here's how the drama unfolds mark driscoll i think it was the following day comes in to do his uh his his uh, I don't want to call it a sermon because I don't believe he preaches, but his sermon. And he gets up on stage and he starts to he, to speak to the conference attendees. And he gets down on one knee, real humble, like kind of lowers his voice. And I guess he claimed, you know, he had kind of a, 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 a horse course kind of voice going on. And he claimed he had been up since I think one o'clock in the morning praying for these men. Why? Well, because the Jezebel spirit, something he's coincidentally written a book on and been preaching about for quite some time, was present at this at this conference. And where it was present was it was the sword swallowing event, which he likened to a striptease. How did he liken it to a striptease? Well, the man opened his shirt. The man was on a pole, which he called an Asherah pole. Uh, if you don't know what an Asherah pole is, that was the basically, um, you know, the, the Asherah poles in the Old Testament were... Uh, you know, worship, uh, I, 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 uh, were, uh, idolatrous worship monuments of sorts where, and, and it was a worship of fornication. And so the Asherah pole is what he calls it. And the man climbed up and ascended and which our God is not arrogant. He doesn't ascend, he descends. And so he begins to say, this is not a rebuke, but this is an observation. He starts discussing how this man was acting like, uh, a, a, you know, a stripper climbing an Asherah pole, being arrogant and as he gets into it, the pastor, John Lindell, calls out, calls him out, says, you're done, you're done. And um, at that point, Mark Driscoll gets up, says, I'll receive that, gets off the stage. And that's the video clip that went around the world. And everybody started saying, hoorah for, um, for Mark Driscoll for calling out what was patently inappropriate. Well, I'm going to challenge that, on, and we'll talk about this more on Apologetics Live, but I'm going to challenge that on a couple of notions. Number one, it wasn't a striptease act. It was highly inappropriate. It was not something that should have been done in a church venue, but it was not a striptease act. And even he says, well, like a stripper, but he doesn't call it a striptease act. Unfortunately, because that terminology and because the guy was shirtless and this was going on, everybody called it a striptease act. He called out a striptease act. No, he didn't. Um, it has come out that since then, We've we've learned that this guy, at least at one point in his history, was a male stripper for when women and men. You know, uh, what does that say about his sexuality? Don't know, but we can probably put two and two together and figure it out. But this was not a street tease event, and since that past history, this has been something that this particular uh, in individual does. Um, Magdala, I forget his first name off the top of my head. His, first, his last name is Magdala. He's been on things like America's Got Talent, and it's it's a uh, subsequent other uh, national versions of it. So in Asia or Europe and stuff like that. So he's done this around the world. 
It's it's his new shtick. This is what he does. It wasn't an Asherah pole. It's literally a pole that is used in these type of athletic displays uh, you know, when you're doing talent shows. Um, it's just like Cirque du Soleil on on their on their, the the satin ribbons that they use. It's those type of events. It's like somebody who does trapeze artist work. They're using you know, the, the tools that are consistent with that trade. It was not an Asherah pole. So what he did was liken it to something that it wasn't so that he could specifically address a topic he himself has been preaching on and has a book about, which is this Jezebel spirit. So it wasn't a really a call out as much as people want to say it was. Uh, but it was, in fact acknowledging that something happened there that should not have. So I will give him that props in that regard, but that's about as far as I can give him any credit. And I don't really give him any credit because I believe there's more at play. And again, I refer you to Justin Peters' uh, YouTube video on this. I think it's fantastic. It really was a publicity stunt, which is consistent with Mark Driscoll's behavior. So since then, what has happened? Well, I don't. I believe it was the same day that he was kicked off the stage. Mark Driscoll was bought, brought back on stage with uh, John Lindell, and basically he walked back his rebuke. Uh, he basically says, "I shouldn't have done that without coming to you first. Now, I will say, the sword swallowing act happened on a Friday, and he didn't say anything, and he'd had opportunity until s Saturday morning when he goes in to have his talk." Doesn't say anything to the the John. I say in air quotes, Pastor John Lindell, and then just drops this bomb. Um, so I I think that's inappropriate. I think if it was a re real concern, you would have gone to him. I don't think it's a Matthew eighteen as John Lindell tried to claim from the stage when he kicked him off. Uh, it was not a sin against John Lindell in which he would go to him in private and enact the the first stages of church discipline. Uh, but I think it's the right and good thing to say if if I'm a guest at your conference and I see something going on, I think it's inappropriate. I'm going to pull you aside and say, this is wrong. It shouldn't be happening. And if you say, well, it's going to happen. And then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say something from the pulpit. So if you let me up there, I'm going to speak. That would have been appropriate to say he didn't. So he walks it back by saying, but this is your house. You're the father of the house. I should have come to you first. And if you said no, then I wouldn't have said it. Well, okay. Everybody's like, hoorah, you spoke out, but who raw nothing, he would have, had he actually done what would probably have been appropriate, he wouldn't have said anything at all. And then later as they discuss it, and he says, yeah, the most awkward moment in history. And he says, you know, I shouldn't have said it. Yeah, I shouldn't have done it. Period. He completely walked it back. So he wasn't being heroic. He was trying to, at this point now, trying to save face. And, and he and Lindell, I'm guessing at some point it said, we got to clean this up because Lindell got booed heavily by the uh, the men in attendance when he kicked him off the stage. Now, that was actually rather comical to watch. Um, but it turned into this big pat on the back session. Everybody was happy, and it's all resolved until it's not. Uh, days later, uh, within days, we are getting a video of John Lindell from the pulpit calling out Mark Driscoll to repent for causing division in his church and causing division in his family. Why? Because immediately after the conference, <laughs> uh, Mark Driscoll <laughs> starts texting John Lindell's son and saying, nope, I was right. There's something evil going on there. You need to take over. You need to take that church away from your father. And this has not stopped. This is still going on to the best of our knowledge. But while all this is going on, that's when... Mark Driscoll puts out, oh, by the way, I have this book on the Jezebel spirit. You want to learn more about it? Here's where you can get it. And by the way, I'll even give you a free PDF copy. Lending more credibility to the, the belief that this was indeed a publicity stunt. <clears throat> so, I am so sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, those listening with earbuds on, I apologize. Um, I had a little something hooky in the back of my throat there. And I did not get to the mute button in time. So, so my apologies. Um, so what does this have to do with the book of Hebrews and Jesus is better? Well, here's, <clears throat> here's my contention. What you have with John Lindell, 
Mark Driscoll and the Stronger Men's Conference is a snapshot of evangelicalism at large. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. I'm going to mute this real fast. I am so sorry, folks. Um, what you have is kind of a snapshot of the pragmatism that is going on in the modern day evangelical church. Uh, just last week, because we uh, I you know, just had things going that I was not able to get out of, I ran a rerun episode that we had done with the guys from Matter of Theology about the perils of pragmatism in the church. And if you haven't listened to that, I really recommend whether you stop this now and go back and listen or download it after this and listen. I, it's a good episode that really, I think, helps highlight the dangers and the risks involved of, of pragmatism. Pragmatism is basically saying, if it works, we're going to do it. It's the ends justify the means. It's the idea that if it puts bodies in the pew and it gets hands raised or people walk aisles, then it doesn't matter if it's in scripture or not. That's what we need to do to get a response from people. And pragmatism will literally jettison scripture in hopes of finding some way to coax people into a decision, into following Jesus, into making a profession of faith. And when it's addressed with those who are raising genuine concerns about it, how dare you? All these people got saved. You have no right to speak, and I certainly like my, uh, my way of doing it than your uh, way of not doing it. Which, by the way, I don't care who uses it. This is one of the worst arguments I've ever heard. Um, you want to respond to, hey, I think your arguments are wrong. Please do so. Like, actually address the argument. But don't kind of dismiss the argument by saying, well, he's at least doing something and you're not. So I like his way of doing it better than yours not. I, I really think it's a dodge. I, I, and I don't care who uses it. I, I, think it's in a, I just don't think it's an appropriate way to, de to debate an issue. Um, and you can, and we can certainly say, look, at least they're trying. Yes, I get that. Um, but it's not a real argument to debate whether the, the validity of an argument. So getting back off that sidetrack. So those individuals will typically ignore, uh, the scriptural concerns and just point to the results. Now, um, there's an adage, I believe it was, so A.W. Tozer, it might have been, who says, what you win them with is what you win them to. Meaning, if you entice people through entertainment, you have to keep them with entertainment. Because if you take the entertainment away and go into the study of Scripture, where they're going to be like, well, that's not what I thought this was about. You you had this big rock show. You had the, you had tanks coming in. You had you know uh, guys climbing poles with swords in their mouths. And now you want to teach me the Bible? Oh, I'm out of here, man. I thought this was going to be something more interesting. So it's the, that's why you know uh, mega churches like James River Church are constantly trying to one up the, what they did the last time, because if they go if they don't do something bigger and better, well we've seen this before. So why did they have a sword swallowing act? Was they hadn't had one before? Why did they have a tank in there? Well because the trucks have already been done, right? So you've got to always be one upping your your pragmatic efforts to draw people in. And you're not trusting Scripture. You're not trusting the Word of God to be what actually is the draw and what actually is uh, what works in the heart of man to lead him to Christ and keep him in Christ. And so that's the that's the big problem. So why is this again? Why does this all matter? How does Hebrews have anything to do with this? So when we're going through the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I'm already halfway into the show. I apologize. Um, but I want to do that to, to kind of establish something. When the writer of Hebrews starts off, he starts off with, you know, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. His first opening salvo is to point right to Christ. It's like we 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 God in, in many ways in the past spoke to us through the prophets and, and, and um yet now 
we hear directly from Christ. Now, how do we today as Christians in 2024 hear from Christ? It is Scripture. We do not get revelation, individual revelation from God. We don't have instructions being beamed down into our head. I know that's going to annoy uh, some of our uh, listeners who might be continuationist or maybe kind of a light form of continuationism. But the Word is what we have. That's why Paul writes to Timothy to say that you know the Word of God is you know is is our revelation, right? It is what we have that helps us to know what it is we need. He says in Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, may be complete, equipped for every good work. That Paul himself, who actually received direct revelation, he was instructed by the Lord for three years in the wilderness, says we have what we need in Scripture. That's how we hear from him today. So, but the the, the writer of Hebrews goes direct to the point. We hear about God from Jesus Christ. And so his entire point from the, from there forward, writing to the Jews, is to point out is to point out how Christ is better than everything that they are looking towards. So the first thing is like angels. He's better than the angels. Remember, you know, the angels would come and speak. Think of, you know, coming to Abraham, coming to Lot. You know, coming to you know various figures in the Old Testament, Dan, uh, Daniel receiving you know the uh, uh, you know direct revelation from an angel about when they would be delivered from Babylon. Over and over again, so angels are extremely important. Yet Christ is higher than the angels. Christ is better than the angels. So he his opening sal- uh, salvo is to talk about that. And so what does he say? Uh, you know, to, to not gr- uh, neglect our salvation. You know, he says, if we, ne- uh, here in chapter two, verse two, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a, gr- uh, such a great salvation? So he, his opening point Here's Jesus. Here's whom you whom you now hear from. He's the one you guys think angels are important. You're getting it direct from Christ. And if the angels were accurate, who pointed to Christ? How how can you neglect what Christ Himself has done for you? He goes forward and then talks about how Jesus is greater than Moses. Now remember, Moses is the patriarch. He is the one who brought the law down from the from, from the mountain. He is the one to whom they always look back to when they want to know what God said about how to do something. You go back to Moses. You go back to his revelation, his written word. But what does he say about that? For Jesus has been in, in chapter three. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory than the builder, or as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. He's here's the lawgiver. Here's the one who brought the law to the people, the thing that was so important to them. And yet, Jesus is greater than Moses. Why? Because he is the builder of the house. He's not the one who's in the house. He's not the creation of the creator. He is the creator himself. He goes further on and he again points to how that this is something we should not neglect. There's this warning about, uh, as he quotes, I believe from, bear with me here. This is what happens when you have older eyes and the print's really small in in the notes and I forget the passage it's from. Uh, quoting from Psalm 95, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. You know, he says, do not harden your hearts. And he, uh, and he says uh, in verse 11, as I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's telling, you know, this passage in, uh, that he's quoting from is saying, there's a, there's a rest coming. The rest wasn't Israel. That that was a rest that the Jews entered into. But Psalm 95, written later, says, don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, as the Jews did, because you may find yourself not entering the rest that is yet promised. So 
Moses, the deliverer, the lawgiver who led them to the promised land, there was that was not the thing that was the actual rest that God was calling for. And he says, don't be like them. For, you know, he says, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the uh, in the rebellion. For it, who were those who heard it and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt by, uh, by Moses? This is verse 16, uh, chapter 3. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned and whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, chapter 4, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us, uh, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So pointing to the rest that the, the Israelites failed to enter, those who rebelled in the wilderness, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, Christ is the Sabbath rest, the genuine rest. Don't fail to enter into that rest the way they failed to enter into a temporary rest. He goes on to say that Jesus is the great high priest. He says in chapter five, he says that, or let me back up and it's still in chapter four, in verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You see the rep repetition here? He's better than this, uh, this type and shadow. And so therefore, don't miss Jesus. Don't miss out on Christ. He says, let us draw with, uh, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And he compares how the, the high priests had were a temporary way of appeasing sin. They came from among men. They were appointed by men and they... They could not do this. Uh, they were not. They didn't take this job on themselves. It was something that was appointed to them. Yet Christ is the better one. In fact, more so than a high priest in terms of the Levitical priesthood, he's the priest according to the order of Melchizedek, a separate order set specifically for him. And I would encourage you to spend some time reading on this in chapter five, explaining who Melchizedek is and why that's important because. It establishes that Christ is better than the Levitical high priest. And again, he goes as he goes forward. He gets into, and it's also he kind of he kind of steps, just touches into it in chapter five, and then comes back to it in chapter seven, and talks about how in he goes kind of into chapter six. There's it kind of ending in five, rolling into six. How there's this, you guys should kind of be knowing this. You should have this you know, foundation, but we're having to lay it again. And so we're going to move forward now. We're going to move further into this. And so he talks about this promise of God um, that here was the, you know, the, the dead works that they, they accomplished nothing. We're going to move on from that. We're going, you know, you, in fact, if you were to someone to somehow find a way to actually fall away from Christ, you couldn't even be brought back. And it's it's kind of like taking it to the, the the extreme level. It's not actually a passage that says you can lose your salvation, but rather an extreme view that if you literally could, were saved and you pulled away of your own accord, it, it, Christ would have to be re-sacrificed. I mean, that's just how complete his, uh, his, his sacrifice is. And yet, you know, to the idea that you could fall away from that, having once tasted of it, there'd be no hope. That's how you know, how important that salvation in Christ is. And Christ, God made this promise that by his own name, that he is God and Lord, that he cannot lie. He will fulfill this. So to those who come to him in Christ, he's going to save. Again, chapter seven, he goes into that 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 detailed uh, explanation of who Melchizedek is and how Jesus 
is from the order of Melchizedek. He is not part of the Levitical priesthood, which could not bring full salvation. At best, they could do a temporary covering because of the constant work of the sacrifice of bulls and goats, that there was no uh, no genuine means of salvation. But the true salvation comes through this priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that Christ is, you know, as we go into uh, chapter 8, he is the high priest of a better covenant. See, the old covenant was based upon the law, which the law itself exposes our sin, and it cannot keep us from sin. We are constantly in this, you know, treadmill of sin, sacrifice, sin, sacrifice. Yet Christ, who enters into the heavenly temple, has completed that work. And he establishes the new covenant, which is no longer of the law, but it is of grace. And so he is the the uh, the guarantee of the new and better covenant. And so as he goes through all of this and he talks about Christ's redemption in uh, through his blood, as we get into uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 11, he says, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of, of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. He is the greater sacrifice. He is the greater high priest. He is the guarantee of the better covenant. His sacrifices complete once for all. You cannot have a better sacrifice than what is in Christ. So why am I going through all this really like rapid fire? Because as he says in chapter 10, starting in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What does James River Church? What does Mark Driscoll do? They put on this huge event to get everybody excited, get the juices flowing, and they give some kind of you know sermonettes for Christianettes. I believe it was uh, John MacArthur called it right, and give you some sort of self help pep talk. Does that teach what this said? No, absolutely not. It is not teaching what this says because it appeals to the flesh of man to make him feel good about himself, to make him feel jazzed about what he's able to accomplish, what God is going to use him for. That's why you entertain. That's why you put on a show. You want to entertain the flesh, but the author, the writer of Hebrews, and if you're one, if you're one who believes that, as I believe is, um, Pastor, or, or, yeah, Doctor James White and Pastor Tom Buck both have argued. Uh, I've heard them say they believe that this is actually a sermon preached by Paul and written down by Luke because it has elements of both in terms of language and and construction. Might be true. There are certain things that I read as I look at this and I go. Time would limit me as he gets into the hall of faith, right? Uh, and he says, uh, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson. Boy, that sounds like somebody who's speaking. And there are a few places in there where it really sounds like when he's talking about, you know, we don't have time to lay a new foundation, right? We were just talking about that where he says, 
you, you need milk, not solid food, right? He, in verse uh, chapter 5, going into verse 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from good work, dead works and faith toward God. It, it's almost as if he's saying, you at this point should already be here and we're going to move forward to get there. And that sounds like somebody's preaching. So that's just me. Uh, I'm, I'm not a PhD as these guys are and have done dissertations on it, but there might be an argument for that. But with that said, the, the author or the writer of Hebrews is doing everything he can to build an argument to, to the Jews about the superiority of Jesus to everything that they knew and built their lives around. Everything about the, the, the Jewish life pointed to, it was a type and shadow of Christ. The, tem- the tabernacle, the temple, was a type and shadow of the heavenly uh, temple where Christ has seated at the right hand of the Father. The sacrifices were a type and shadow of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. The high priests are a type and shadow of Christ as high priest. You know, Melchizedek pointing to king and priest, right? And that is what he is called in the order of the order of Melchizedek as high priest. Everything that this writer does establishes the absolute certainty of who Christ is. So therefore draw near, do not neglect so great a salvation. Do not fall away. Do not, you know, uh, do not reject him as in the day of rebellion, enter into this rest, draw near to him because he is the perfect sacrifice. He is the perfect high priest. He has satisfied everything once for all. That is how we as Christians are called to communicate the gospel message. We are to communicate the superiority, the loveliness, the graciousness, the kindness, the mercifulness of Christ, but in conjunction with the wrath of God, the judgment to come, those that would fall away have no hope, right? Over and over again, this is the drumbeat of the book of Hebrews, and it is utterly absent in things like the Stronger Men's Conference. Oh, the gospels preach, Chris. How can you say that? Because they had a sword swallower starting their opening act. They were not sitting here saying, let's come together. Let's pray. Open your Bibles. Thus says the Lord. Boom. Let's go forward. They are appealing to the flesh. They are appealing to that which, you know, entertains that makes us get excited and makes us you know, get hypnotic by the, 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 the music and the beat to where we feel so important, so awesome. How, well, wow, what a, what a very cool thing that God is here. But you don't, what you don't hear preached is where he says, today, if you hear your, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the, as in the day of, or harden your hearts as in the rebellion he is not preaching, do not neglect so great a salvation. If James River Church, if Mark Driscoll and all these other mega church, church growth gurus, you know, um, pragmatic, seeker friendly churches preach this, they'd be emptied out in a heartbeat. There's nothing that appeals to man here. It's all about Christ. It's all about his superiority. It's all about he as God, creator, king, and priest. It is glorifying him and him alone. He goes through the, you know, the book uh, in, 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 in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, all of these great heroes of the faith who accomplished amazing things. Why? Because they looked to God and the promise of the Messiah to come. And they, they accomplished amazing things, but they were also, as he says, starting in, uh, I believe in verse 35, women received back the dead, uh, their dead from the res- uh, by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. 
wandering about in deserts, mountains, and in dens and and the caves of the earth. If that was your opening act at the Stronger Men's Conference, to say, by the way, those of you who follow Christ, this could be you. You could be called to suffer. In fact, many of you will be called to suffer because we know that the birthright of every Christian is persecution, right? Though all those who desire to live godly will face persecution. That's a promise of scripture. So maybe different levels, but you will suffer. How quickly would that empty out, that, that, that con uh, conflagration of people? <coughs> Pardon me. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> I promise you, conference wouldn't have a year too. Not at that, not that size. If James River Church preached this message, it would empty it out immediately. Because these men have been fed junk food. It's all about them. It's all about their machismo. It's all about their testosterone. It's not about Christ. Verse 39 of chapter 11. Excuse me. I seem to have something stuck in my throat. He says, of these men who have been suffering for Christ, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should they should not be that apart from us they should not be made perfect. They didn't even get what they were promised in this life. They were looking forward to something better. What was it? Chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with the endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Why? This is what we're called to. Why does that all that matter? Because Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. We don't need pragmatic, uh, super extravaganza events. We need Christ in him crucified. Paul himself said, I, I, I came to you with, uh, to, to, with only one thing in mind, and I'm paraphrasing, Jesus Christ in him crucified. Go, you know, for chap in, in chapter 12, verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You want to encourage a group of men? You want to encourage them to be in it for the long haul? Point to Christ who endured more than we can ever endure. He was put to death on the cross for sins he did not commit, and he did so willingly. He was tormented, tortured, suffered, died, and was buried. And he did that so that we, as men and women of God, could receive salvation and then go forward and do the work that God gave us to do. The work that he established in eternity past, before we were even a, a blip on the radar, those works were established for us. You want to encourage men to be bold point them to christ don't point them to themselves men are weak we we crumble under the the least amount of suffering christ endured the cross without a word of complaint the writer of hebrews in, in verse 4 here says in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. It's like you haven't even reached that point yet. Christ did this. He is the one who has equipped you. He is the one who indwells you. He is the one who has made you his. He is the one who has set you aside and given you a new creation and a new heart. You haven't even reached that point where he is at. You have not yet shed blood in, you know, in, in trying to uh, resist your sin. You can go forward. You can endure because of Christ. Why could the apostles be beaten and bloodied and stuck in a prison 
left in the pitch dark in the nastiest dungeons and then come out praising his name because they were counted worthy to suffer because Christ suffered because Christ indwells them. And now they look to him the you know, the founder and perfecter of their faith. God, he, and he points here about how God disciplines those whom he loves. We're not illegitimate children. We are, we are people who have the, uh, you know, the spirit of God indwelling us. We have been purchased. We have been made his own. And so one of the marks of being his is, guess what? Being disciplined. Disciplined sometimes for correction. Disciplined sometimes as a soldier is disciplined in the art of war. Trained day in and day out, going through suffering, trials, and tribulations to be equipped to fight a war, right? That is what God does for us. So when he is bringing these things into your life, guess what? That is a mark that God loves you. His discipline in your life is a mark that you are his and he loves you and he is shaping you. There is a judgment coming in this world. It's not here yet. I, I love how my, my pastor puts it, you know, speaking of the times that God does bring some form of judgment into, uh, into this world. He calls it, calls it God, God's pre-wrath wrath. In other words, a, pre for, a form of wrath that is preceding that which his ultimate and full wrath will one day be poured out. So when we see judgment of some kind being done, it's a for, what he calls it pre-wrath wrath. And that was his teaching on uh, you know, as we went through the book of Revelation, talking about like things like the bulls and trumpets and all these things. Talking about all the times God pours out judgment. We are part of Christ's kingdom. We have been purchased by his blood. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we have a promise of eternal life. So all those who repent, turn from their sins, and turn to Christ are his, purchased. It doesn't matter how bad it gets here. We have that promise. It can never be taken from us because Christ is better. Christ is the better high priest. Christ, Christ is the better sacrifice. Christ is the guarantee of, of, of the better covenant. Covenant. He's, the be, he's better than Moses. He's better than the angels. All of these things that the Jews look toward as, you know, as, as, as establishing who they were and, and, and their life and practice. He says it's, he, it's better, he's better than all of that. All of this pointed to him. So don't neglect this salvation. Don't reject it. Don't flee from it. Don't turn from it. Submit to Christ. It's not about you. It's about Christ. That's what this message over and over and over again, this drumbeat, Christ is worth it. He is better. There is nothing about you that makes it better. There's nothing about you that is better. You need the one who is better. Mark Driscoll isn't preaching that. John Lindell is not preaching that. James Richard Church is not preaching that. And Stronger Men's Conference sure is, uh, uh, heck, not preaching that. That's why they have sword swallowers. That's why they have tanks and boxing matches and whatever chaos they throw in there. Every year they do these things because they don't preach Christ and him crucified. They'll tell you they do. They'll tell you, oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. We believe in the gospel. And then they'll tell you about all the things that God does, you know, you know, all the things that God needs to do for you. Rather than what have you done for Christ? Have you surrendered your life? Are you willing to endure the greatest trials you have ever encountered in your life? Are you ready to suffer, to even die? For Christ, because he is worthy. They're not preaching that. So when I talk about the backdrop of James River Church, when people say, oh, good on Mark Driscoll for being such a hero when he wasn't, for, for taking a stand until he didn't, for rebuking a, a male stripper, which it wasn't, I can't. I can't praise the man. Because the man has been part of this for years. One of the video clips, and I believe Justin Peters shows it, 
is where they have their little sit down meeting and Driscoll walks back what he says. He says that first time that Driscoll had come out there to preach, it was in 2008. Now, this was before Driscoll's fall uh, from grace in 2014. Um, but I know uh, as uh, and the first time he preached at James River Church was in 08, started a participate. Now, he fell and was removed from his church for flagrant prob- uh, sinful problems in 2014. In 2017, he's preaching at these Stronger Men's Conferences. So from 2017 to 2024, you have multiple years, seven years, of compromise after compromise after compromise of selling a entertainment program to the men in the, in, under the name of Jesus. And Mark Driscoll didn't once complain, not once. But when he's got a book that he had written the previous year, and when he's got a sermon laid out that connects to that, he finds this opportunity to talk about it. And because Lindell got caught off guard and threw him off stage, everybody turns him into a hero. Folks, that's just not what happened. It's not what happened. It was a stunt. And maybe it went sideways, but it's not what it was. And the thing is, why am I not willing to give him a pat on the back? Because he hasn't earned it, number one. But number two, he's not preaching Christ. He's participating in a show. And the only reason he said anything was because that one instance worked in with his sermon and it went south when he got called out on the stage for it. I have more problem with all of James River Church, John Lindell, and the Driscolls of the world. Not because of the Sword Swallowing Act, but because they reject the message of the scriptures which say Christ is the one whom we are to go to, that we do all these things for. It is not about us. We do not do the things that we are called to do so that we can make much of ourselves. In fact, I believe it was Paul in Galatians re- talking about why these people that have bewitched you and drawn you back into the law, they why do they do it? To make much of themselves. Paul was angry with the Judaizers who were drawing the Galatians back under the law, out of the law of grace, out of the new covenant, because they wanted to make much of themselves. That's Lindell. That's Mark Driscoll. That's James River Church. That's what happens at the Stronger Men's Conference. It's about making much of themselves and not making much of Christ. They'll slap his name on it because it sells, but it's not about making much of Christ. Everything we do, we are called to glorify God, not ourselves. And the book of Hebrews repeatedly hammers that home. It is all about Christ. So does the book of Hebrews specifically speak to what happened at the Stronger Men's Conference? No. But what we learn from the book of Hebrews is Christ is better. And so there's nothing in this world that we look to to make ourselves right with God, to accomplish of our own accord something that is within our power. Rather, what the book of Hebrews tells us is that we turn to Christ and we trust in him and we do not neglect that rest. We do not neglect that salvation. We press on because he is the founder and the uh, he is the founder and perfecter of our faith, pardon me. That is a message that is far more important than giving kudos to a glory-seeking a disqualified preacher who found five seconds of fame because he was trying to promote something he was already doing. So, no, it doesn't have that specific venue in mind, but it speaks to Christ, whom we are to be submitted to in all things, And when we look to broader evangelicalism and we see things like the Stronger Men's Conference, we can go, that's not of Christ. Because it's not making much of Christ, it's making much of the men there. 
So hopefully that's helpful to you. Maybe that explains why there are, for you, there are some people who look at Mark Driscoll and go, I'm not, I'm not giving him kudos. I don't think he's a hero. I don't think he was courageous. It's like, well, why can't you give him some kudos? Because there's more at stake. And what's at stake is, is the gospel of Christ itself. And I won't compromise that. I know others won't either. But as I read through Hebrews and I just, I had that event in the back of my mind. And I discussed it with people online and boy, I had, I had some very upset people with me. <laughs> I will say my engagements went through the roof. It was, it was pretty wild. Um, let, let me just end with this. Um, as I had that in mind and I'm reading this, it, I felt just so humbled by the word of God. It just brings you to your knees when you're looking at it, the way scripture lays it out. And then I think about those who defended Driscoll. Why? Well, we have all this compromise and all these evil, vile things happening in the church. And we need men with, well, I'm going to say spines. I had people use other male anatomy. Use your imagination. I won't say it. To say these things. When I hear something like that, I don't hear humility. When I hear, well, we need these kind of brave men. They need to have a spine of steel and they need to say these hard things. <clears throat> First off, I ask, where have you been for the last couple of generations as preacher after preacher after preacher have spoken boldly and prophetically against the compromises of the world? Did you have fingers in your ears? Because there's a lot of them. That's my first thought. But secondly, I'm looking at what is that what is Driscoll appealing to? Same thing stronger man's conference stronger men's conference is appealing to the flesh. When Mark Driscoll was disqualified and he disqualified himself from being a pastor at Mars Hill and then f essentially fled church discipline. He tried to basically start up all over again, which he's not permitted to do per the qualifications of 1 Timothy and Titus. And in the recent years, as the whole woke movement became more apparent as to what was going on, Mark Driscoll started coming out and going, woke bad, woke evil. We need to, do, to destroy woke, blah, blah, blah. And just started trying to talk tough about how, how bad this is. And a generation of Christians who came up between 2014 and now who have no idea what Mark Driscoll really is about glommed onto that because they wanted that angry, tough talk, spine of steel, manly man kind of response. They rejected the preaching of godly men who had been saying these things for generations as being not enough. We needed this. And they are ignorant, I'm sorry, uh, I hate to say it this way, but they are ignorant of how they are being manipulated. And then I look at the book of Hebrews and this just earnest plea to not neglect the salvation in Christ and let me show you why. Yes, there's powerful language in there, and we should be willing to speak powerfully, but we speak humbly. We speak with love. We speak with compassion and kindness burning in our hearts because we, too, were just as wicked and vile as the worst this society has to offer. I think we forget that. I think we look at the world around us and we look at the LGBTQIA plus whatever. I'm losing track of the letters. We look at the trans movement. We look at you know the, the progressivism and liberalism and we're looking at the social Marxists and the communists and we go, this is all wicked. This is all evil. It's destroying God. Everything that God put here. You're right. They are. And such were some of you. Such were some of me. Such were all of us prior to Christ and his mercy redeeming us. 
Think about that moment when you first heard the gospel and your heart was crushed. When you realized who Jesus Christ was and who you were and why you needed him. That's the book of Hebrews. To, that's the letter written to Jews who needed to hear about Christ. And it has application to us today because, yeah, many of us aren't Jewish, but we can look at that and we can see that argument built about who Jesus Christ is and why we too should not should not neglect so great a salvation. You needed someone. You didn't need a Mark Driscoll to tell you how bad all the wicked, vile stuff in the society is. You needed someone to say you are rebel sinner against Christ. You need to turn from your sins. You need to trust in Christ because you will be condemned to go to hell apart from his, his gracious kindness and mercy. But if you will do so, he will redeem you and make you his, and you will spend eternity with a loving Savior who died in your place. That's what you needed to hear, right? Did you need someone to come around and rah, rah, we're going to take over society and we're going to prove how manly we are? No, you needed someone who loved you enough to save you through the power of the gospel. When I hear someone like Mark Driscoll, I just shiver. Because yes, we need strong men, but we need strong men who realize their strength is not in them, it's in Christ. And they will point to Christ. We need a generation of he, uh, writers of Hebrews who will forsake all that the world has to offer, be willing to endure the worst that the world can throw at him so that it can preach Christ and him crucified. We don't need a, a generation of Mark Driscoll's. We've had it. They've come, they've gone. It'll happen again. And it's happening right now. Young Restless and Reformed is happening all over again. It's just under a different label. And some are trying to reach back and grab them to bring them forward again. Don't need them. Never did. How did the world get turned upside down? Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots. Simple men who just simply went out and preached Christ and Him crucified. That's not to say we don't war against the evils of this time. We certainly do. But we do so with Christ at the head. Not our ideologies, not our machismo, not our, our, our testosterone, none of those things. Christ at the head, we in humble service behind. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope it maybe explains if you saw any things that I posted in, uh, in the last week with regard to Driscoll and the events of James River Church and maybe wondered why I you know, took the stand that I did. Uh, I hope that'll help. I hope it makes you see that there was something more at stake. And hopefully, as we've done that quick run through of Hebrews, there's so much there. Uh, it, it, I finished it this week, and I've just been running this through my head. I, 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 it would have been great to sit down and have like a scripted out study. And uh, I, 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 you know, trying to do this on my own and uh, and, and with the time available and and working a new job. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I hope this made sense. I hope it helped you. Uh, so appreciate that uh, you stuck through me, stuck with me through it. So um, as we close out, I just want to thank you again for sp uh, spending your time with us. Uh, thank you for your prayers for Rich. Continue to pray for him and his family. Pray that the Lord will uh, make it possible for him to come back. I know he misses being here. Uh, and I know that with the things that they faced, just even the short times that he and I can even text one another um, is such a relief to him. So if you would be just encourage, if, if you happen to follow him on social media, just encourage him. Uh, let him know that you're praying for him and that uh, you love his family and that, that you're lifting them all up in prayer. I think he would love to hear that. And uh, with that said, uh, as my brother uh, says, Rich says every week, you know, find somebody this week and proclaim the biblical way of salvation to them. And whatever you do this week, do it for the glory of God, not for yourself, not to promote your ideology, not to promote uh, manliness or uh, your know, conservative you know, politics or sociopolitical sphere. Humble yourself before the Lord 
submit yourself to his will. And then whatever you do this week, go out and do it for his glory. God bless you guys. Good night. We will see you hopefully this weekend in celebration of eight years of podcasting on this program. Now, that's a big deal for us. I know James White. I know, James, I know you've been at for 40 plus years. It, this is a big deal for us. It's eight years. Um, and we hope that maybe we can, we'll be able to continue to do more as God wills with this small platform. And so we just thank you and we're going to wish you a good night. We'll see you next time.